Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial all draws on apace. Four happy days bring another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, like a septame to a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philistrate. Stir the Athenian youth to mermaids. Awake the pertinent history of the moon. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our fault. Hippolyta, I will with my sword, winning thy love and doing the injuries. But I'll wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, with reveling. Happy be Theseus, a renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I, with a complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gods, conceits, knacks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment and unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, be it so she will not hear before your grace consent marry with Demetrius. As I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, that I may dispose of her, which shall either be to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid. To you, your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, one whom you would have formed in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power, to lead the figure disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind. Wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked but with my eyes. Rather with your father's eyes must your judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case of earth is to let Demetrius. Either to die the death, or forever abjure the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know that you do. Examine well your blood. Whether you have not your father's choice, you can endure the liberty of none. For I, in shady cloister from you, to love a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon, thrice blessed to those who know their blood. Tend to those that's made a pilgrimage, but earthlier happy is a rose is still than that which, withering on the virgin thorn, grows, lives and dies in single blessedness. So I will grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose on which yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause and by the next moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me, for everlasting bond of fellowship. Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius, as he would, or on that altar protest for I, austerity, and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have a father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermias. Do you marry him? Scorn for Lysander. True, he hath my love. And what of mine, my love shall render him, and she is mine, and all my right for I do in state unto Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed, my love is more than his. My fortunes every way is fairly rent, if not with vantage as Demetrius. And, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, may love the Nedda's daughter, Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconsistent man. I must confess that I have heard as much, and with Demetrius, I thought this both thereof, but being full of self affairs, my mind did lose it. So come, Demetrius, and come, Aegeus, I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look to arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means you may extenuate. Hippolyta, which here, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial, and confer with you on something that nearly concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? 
What chance the roses there do fade so fast? You like for want of rain, which I could well between them from the tempest of my eyes. Aye, me. For aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different in blood. Oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Or else misgraft in respect of years. Oh, spite too old to be engaged too young. Or else laid upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or, if there are sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the coiled night, that, in a spleen, unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our child patience, because it is a customary cross. As you to love is wishes and tears, dreams and sighs, poor fancy's followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, to do observance to a morn of May. There will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which needeth souls and prospers love, by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke, and number more than ever woman spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me. Tomorrow will I truly meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. Thought, sweet fair Helena, whither away? Call you me fair? That fair again, and say? Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Your eyes are low stars, and your tongue sweet air. More too noble than lark to shepherd's ear, when we as grain and hawthorn buds appear. Sick as this is catching, oh, favor so. Here's what I catch for Hermia. Here I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye, your eye. My tongue, your tongue's sweet melody. Oh, if the world were mine with Demetrius being faded, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius' heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. How let your frowns to teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. How that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helen, has no fault of mine. None but your beauty, or what fault were mine. Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander, myself, will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Though then what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned to heaven unto hell. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. When Phoebe doth behold her silver visage on the watery glass, decking with looked pearl the bladed grass, a time that lovest flights doth conceal. Through Athens' gates we have devised to steal. And in the woods, where often you and I, upon faint, primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of the counsel sweet. There my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to seek new friends and strangers' companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight, from lover's food tomorrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius dote on you. How happy some or some can be. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know at all, but he do know. And as he hears doling on Hermia's eye, so I, in mind of his qualities, thinks base and vile, holding no quantity. Love comes transposed to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. So therefore, as we can keep it painted blind. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings in no eyes, figure on heedy haste. And therefore, is love said to be a child? Because in choice he's self beguiled. As waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he held on oath that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia fell, so he dissolved, and the towers of oaths did melt. I will go tell Demetrius of fair Hermia's flight, and then to the wood will he, tomorrow night, pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is but a dear expense. But here in me and I turn to my pain, to have a sight thither and back again.
Is all our company here? You were the best to call them, man by man, according to the script. Here is a scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens, to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess, on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, just say what the play treats on, and then read the names of the actors from the scroll, so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Very good piece of work, I assure you. And a married. Now, read the names of the actors. Masters, spread yourselves. Okay, first here, ah, uh, Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. Nick Bottom, you are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus, a lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. Mm. That will ask for some tears in the true performing of it. Let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I'll condole in some measure. Yet, my chief humor is to a tyrant. I could play Ericles rarely, the part to tear a cat in, to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates. Amphibus car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates. This was lofty. Now, name the rest of the players. This is Ericles' vein, a tyrant's vein, a lover's more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It's the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming in. That's all one. You may play in the mask and speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisney, Thisney. Ah, oh, Pyramus, my lover dear, thy Thisbe dear and lady dear. <laughs> No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you will play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Thisbe's father. Myself, Pyramus's father. Uh, Snow the Dorner, you will have the lion's part. And here, I hope, is a play for the have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it to me, for I am slow to study. You may play it at Sen for for there's nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too, for I would roar you that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will even make the duke say, let him roar again, let him roar again. And should you roar too terribly, you would fright the duchess and all the ladies, that they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That, that would hang us, us, every mother's son. If they had no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice, that I will roar you as gently as any, as any sucking dove, Aunt Twarney Nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, a most gentleman-like man, as one might see on a summer's day, perhaps. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard best I play in? Why, what you will. I could discharge it in either your straw-colored beard, your orange and tawny beard, purple and grain beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your perfect yellow beards have no hair at all, and then you'll play bare faced <coughs> But masters, here are your parts, and I'm to entreat you, request you, and desire you to calm them by tomorrow night and meet in the palace woods a mile without the town. There we will rehearse, for if we meet within the city, we'll be dogged with company, and our devices known. In the meantime, I'll draw a bill of property such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet presently, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pain, be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's opening meet. Enough. Hold or cut both strings. upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coats, spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favors, in their gold coats live their sabers. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl on every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. My queen and all her elves come here and on. The king doth keep his rivals here tonight. Take heed, the queen come not within his sight, for Oberon pestling fell in wrath, and she is attended half. A lovely boy, stolen from the Indian king, she had never so sweet a changeling. 
And jealous, jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train, to trace the forest wild. But they never meet in grove or green, by fountain clear or spang with starlight sheen. And their elves hide for fear, creep into acorn cups and hide themselves there. Either I mistake your shape and make him quite, or else you are that shrewd and neighbor sprite, called Robin Goodfellow. Are you not he that frights the maidens of the villagery, skim milk and sometimes labor in the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewife turn, and sometimes the drink to bear no barn, mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm? Those that hobgoblin call you, and sweet puck, you do their work, and they have good luck. Are you not he? <laughs> Thou speakest all right. I'm the merry wanderer of the night, and I jest to Oberon and make him smile. When I a fat, bean fetid horse beguiled, name the likeliness of a filly foal, as sometimes I lurk in the gossip's bowl, in the very likeliness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks, against her lips I bob, and on her withered dewlap pour the ale. But moon fairy, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress, would that he were gone. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What, jealous Oberon? Fairy, skip hence. I forsworn his bed and company. Terry, rash Walton, am not I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in shape of corn sat all day, play on pipes of corn and versing love tamers, Philida. Why art thou here? Come from the farthest steep of India. But that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buckskin mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania? Glance at my credit with Apolta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus. Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering night from Perigenia, whom he ravished, and make him with fair ego break his faith with Ariadne and Antiopha? These are the forgeries of jealousy. Ever since the middle of summer spring met we on hill, by the forest or in the beach margin of the sea, to dance the ringlets to the whistling wind, but by thou brawls has disturbed our sport. <sighs> the seasons alter, the hoary headed frost falls on the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old times, the thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of the sweet summer buds, is as a mockery set. The spring, the summer, the child and autumn, the angry winter, change the wanted libraries in the mazed world. But by thou increase, now not knows what which is which. And these same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her over on? I do but beg a little change from boy to be my henchman. <laughs> Set your heart at rest. The fair land binds out the child in me. His mother was a votress of my order, and the spice in the air, full often has she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traders on the flood, as from a voyage rich with merchandise, but... She, being mortal, of that boy did die. And for her sake I do rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this world intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day, if you patiently dance an hour on and see what the moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me and I'll spare your haunts. Give me that boy and I will go with thee. <laughs> not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away! I shall trow downright if I longer stay. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle cup, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon the promontory and heard a mermaid on dolphin's buck uttering such a dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song. Certain stars shot mounting from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and earth, Cupid, all armed with certain aim, he took at a fair vestal, thrown by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow as if it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's ruin, and maidens call it love and idleness. Fetch me this flower, with herb I shrew thee once, the juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid, shall make a man or woman madly doubt upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this flower, and be thou ere the leviathan comes from the leaf. I put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, I shall make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible, and I shall overhear their conference. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou told me they were stolen into this wood, and here I am in wood within this wood because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence get you gone, follow me no more. You draw me a heart on an adamant, yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to drop, and I will have no more, no more power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or do I not in plainest truth tell you that I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that, do I love you the more? I'm your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fall on you. 
Use me but as your spaniel. Strike me, spur me, neglect me, lose me, only give me leave. Unworthy as I am to follow you, what worse a place can I beg in your love? And yet a place of high respect for me than to be used as you use your dog. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit. For I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much. To leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not. To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege. For that, it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore, I think I am not in the night. Nor doth this without girls of company. For you and my respect are all the world. So how can it be said I am alone when I have all the world to look on me? I'll run from you and hide me in the bricks, and leave you to the mercy of the wild beasts. The wild is half not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story will be, will be changed. Apollo flies, and Daphne holds the chase. The duck pursues the griffin. The mile behind makes speed the captured tiger. Boot the speed. When cowardice pursues, and valor flies. I will not stay thy questions. Let me go, or if thou follow me, do not believe but I shall do thee mischief Hi, in the wood. In the temple, in the town of the field, you do me mischief. Pride, Demetrius, you're wrong to set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed, and we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee, make a heaven of hell, to die upon the hand I love so well. Fare thee well, nymph, ere he do leave this grove. Thou shalt fly, and he shall seek thy love. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Why, there it is. A pretty thing give it to me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows, white over canopied over lustrous woodland, with sweet musgrows of them with egg and thyme. There Titania sleeps sometimes in the night, molding these flowers with dances and delight. And there the snake throws her enamel skin, weed wet enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of faithful fantasies. Take that some of it. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with this disdainful youth. You may know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on, but affect it with some care, that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And meet me ere the first cock grow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. <laughs> And a fairy song, then for a third part of a minute, and some to kill cankers. And in the musk rose buds, some wore with weary mice for their leather wings to make my small elves coats. Some keep back the clamor cell that nightly hits and wanders at our quaint spirits. Sing me now to sleep, and then to your offices, and let me rest. You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Newt and blind worms do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Fill a mel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby. Never harm or spell nor charm, come our lovely lady night, and so good night with lullaby. Weaving spiders come not here, hence to long like spinners hence. Beetles black approach not near, worm nor snail do no offense. Fill a mel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby. Never harm or spell nor charm, come our lovely lady night, and so good night with lullaby. Pits away, now all is well, one of loose hands sent him out. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love's sake. Love and language for his sake, be it on ounce or cat or bull or bear, and part or boar with bristled hair, wake when some vile thing is near. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood, and to speak troth, I have forgot our way. Well, rest us here, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, find you out of bed. Cry upon this bank, will rest my head. One turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one trough. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet, do not lie so near. How oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence! Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms and a chain with an oath, so then two bosoms and a single trough. Then by your side no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia. I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia was to say Lysander lied. But gentle friend, for love and courtesy, lie further off in human modesty. Such separation may as well be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend. Thy love ne'er alter till thy life's sweet end. Amen. Amen to that fair prayer, say I. And then life when I in loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wish's eyes be pressed. Through the forest I have gone, but a thing ain't found I none, on whose eyes might prove flowers forced stirring love. Night and science, who is here? 
Queen of Athens you doth wear? This is he, my master said, despite the Athenian maid. And here she lay, sleeping sound on the deck and dirty ground. Pretty soul, durst not in the lie. Near this lacking love, this kill courtesy. Sure, upon the eye I throw all the power this charm doth owe. Sleep seen on thy eyelids, so wake when I'm gone. For now, I must go, Veron. Tell me, I charge thee, heads, and do not haunt me thus. I will tell directly and plead me, do not so. Stay on that peril, I alone will go. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the less is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoever she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright, not with salt tears? If so, my eyes are often are washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore, no marvel though Demetrius do as a monster to my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine may it compare with Hermia's fiery eye? But who is here? Lysander, on the ground, dead or asleep. I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, feel of good sir, awake. And run through fire, I will, for thy sweet sake. Transparent, Helena. Nature shews aught that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia? Hoard what though. Yet Hermia still loves you, so be content. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who would not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you're the worthy I made. Things growing are not ripe until their season, so I, being young, till now not ripe to reason, and touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will, and leads me to your eyes, where I overlook love stories, written in love's richest... Wherefore was I to this king mockery born? Lend your hands that I deserve this scorn. Is it not enough, is it not enough, young man, that I did know, nor never can, deserve us to be looked from Demetrius' eye, but you must fault my sufficiency? Good troth you do me wrong, good sooth you do, in the most disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, perforce I must confess, I thought you loved more true gentleness. Well, that a lady who one man a few should have another, therefore be abused. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayest thou come like sand and near. For, as a surfer to the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings. Or, as the heresies that men do leave, are hated most of those they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit and my heresy, of all be hated, but the most of me. And all my powers addressed your love and might, to honor Helen, and to be her knight. Help me, Lysander, help me! Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast! Ay me, for pity, what a dream was here. Lysander, look how I do quake with fear. Me thought a serpent eat my heart away, and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander? What? Removed? Lysander, Lord! What? Out of hearing? Gone? No sound, no word? Like, where are you? Speak, and if you hear, speak of all loves. I swoon almost with fear. No, then I will perceive you are not nigh, either death or you all find immediately. Are we all met? Pat, pat, and here's a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green block plot will be our stage. This Hawthorne break our tiring house, and we will do an action as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are some things in this comedy of Pyramus that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How are you that? By your liking, a part of spirit. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a whit. I have advice to make all well. Write me a prologue. Let the prologue seem to say that we will do no harm with our swords. And that I, Pyramus, am not killed indeed. Let it also say that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put them out of their fear. We will have such a prologue, and it will be written in eight and six. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afraid of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. To bring in, God shield us. 
A lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing. There is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living. We ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, he must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he must say thus, or to the same defect, Ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. For if you think I come hither as a lion, it were a pity of my life. For no, I am just a man, as any other men are. And then he will name his name and say plainly that he is Snug the Joiner. Well, that shall be so. But there are two hard things. That is, to bring moonlight into the great chamber. For, you know, Pyramus and Thisbe did speak through moonlight. Doth the moon shine that night in player play? A calendar. A calendar. Look at the alman almanac. Find out the moonshine. Find out the moonshine. Moonshine. Here we go. Yes, it doth shine that night. Then we may leave a casement of the great chamber window open, and through that casement shall the moon shine. Well, that will be great. But there is another hard thing. We would either have to have a person presenting moonshine with a lantern and bush of thorn, and then we must also have a wall in the great chamber for Pyramus and Thisbe to speak through. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present a wall, and let him have some loam or some plaster or some rough cast about him to signify wall. And let him hold his fingers thus, and this will be the, the cranny that Pyramus and Thisbe shall whisper through. If that may be, then all is well. Come sit down with your mother's son and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin, and you have spoken your speech, and you threw that break, and so every one according to his cue. What have been homespun heavy swag on here? So near the cradle of the fairy queen. What a play towards, or be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Pyramus, you begin. Thisbe, stand forth. Thisbe, thy flower's odious savor sweet. Odors, odors. Odors savor sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe dear. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. Ah, strange appearance they are played here. Must I speak now? Aye, Mary must you. You must understand he goes, but to see a noise he heard, and is to come again. <laughs> most radiant Pyramus, most lily white of hue, a color of the red rose of triumphant briar, most briskly juvenile and eke most lovely Jew, as true as true as horse. I yet would never tire. Truly, will I meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninus's tomb? Why, man, you say all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter, your cue is past. It is never tired. Oh. <clears throat> as true as true as horse, I yet would never tire. If I were fair, Thisbe, I were only dying. Oh, monstrous! Oh, strange! We are haunted! Pray, masters! Fly, masters! <laughs> I'll follow you. I'll lead you around. Through the bog, through the bush, through the brake, through the briar. Sometimes a horse will be, sometimes a hound. And neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn, like a horse, hog, hound, fire at every turn. <sighs> this is a knavery of them to make me a fear. O oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on me? What do you see? An ass out of your own, do you? Ah! <laughs> Bottom, bless thee, thou art translated. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to frighten me, thank you. But I will not let them. I will walk up and down this place, and I will show them that I am not afraid. The old silcock so black of hue with orange tawny bill. The frostle with his note so true, the wren with little quill. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose note full many a man doth mark and dares not answer. Nay! <laughs> For what foolish a man would cry the lie, though a, a bird cry cuckoo never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note, so is mine eye much enthralled to thy shape. Thy fair force before stop moving. On the first you to say to swear, I love thee. 
Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. <laughs> and yet, to say the truth, love and reason keep little company together nowadays. How art wise, is how art beautiful. Uh, not so, neither, but if I have enough wit to get out of this wood, I have enough wit to serve my own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common right. The summer still doth tend upon my state. I love thee, therefore go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee and fetch thee jewel from the deep and sing while thou on pressed flowers doth sleep. I purge thee mortal grossness so. Thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace, blossom, moth, cobweb, and mustard seed. Ready? And I. And I. Nay. Where shall, shall we go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots, dewberries, purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for night he just crop their wax and thighs. Then light them at fiery glowworms' eyes. To have my love, to bend and to arise. To pluck the wings from painted butterflies. To fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Not to mouse, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal! Hail! 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 I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your name, good sir. Cobweb. Good Master Cobweb, if I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. I desire more of your acquaintance. Um, your name, I beseech you, good sir? Peace Blossom. Good Master Peace Blossom, commend me to Ma Mistress Peace Squash, your mother, and Master Peace God, your father. <laughs> For I desire more of your acquaintance, too. Your name, I beseech you? Mustard Seed. Good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly giant-like ox beef hath devoured many a gentleman of your house, and that your kindred hath made my eyes water ere now. Now, I desire more of your acquaintance too. Come, lead him to my bower. The moon he thinks looks with the watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower. Lamenting on some enforced chastity, tie I love his tongue, bring him silently. Titania, be awake. Then what it was an ex or I, which you must own our extremity? How now, mad spirit? <laughs> what night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with the monster is in love, and while she in her dull, concerted hour, she was in her dull sleeping hour. A crew of patches were met together to rehearse a play, intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. Thou thickest skin, barren sort, who Pyramus presented in sport? <laughs> Forsook his scene. And entered in a break when I did him advantage take, and as his no life fixed upon his head, anon his this be must be answered. And when forth my mimic comes, when they him when they him spy, or rest up has the wild geese that creep a fowler eye, or rest up has the birds many and sore, rising and calling at guns report, serves themselves and madly sweep the sky, so at his sight away his fellows fly. When in that moment so came to pass, Titania waked and straightway loved an ass. This falls out better than I could devise, but has so yet last evening his eyes with the love juice as I did bid to do? I took him sleeping. That is finished, too, with the Athenian woman by his side, that when he wake a force, she must be eyed. Oh, stand close. This is the same Athenian. Uh, this is the woman, but not this the man. Oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Thy breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, has given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleeping, or shoes in blood, plunge in the deep, and kill me, too. The sun was not so true until the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe it as soon as this whole earth may be born, and that the moon may through the center creep, and so displease her brother's new tides with the antipodes. It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look, so dead, so grim. So should the murdered look, and so should I pierce through the heart of your stern cruelty. But you, the murderer, look as bright and as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Demetrius, will thou give him me? I had rather he was carcass to my house. Out, dog, out, cur! Thou hast driven me past the bounds of a maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him, then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, once, tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Durst thou looked upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? A brave touch, could not a worm, and adder do so much, and adder did it for a doubler tongue, than thine, thou serpent, never adder stunned. Spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of my son his blood, nor is he dead, for aught I can tell. I pray thee, then, tell me he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege, never to see me more. And from thy hated presence, I part so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. 
There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for debt which bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, which now, in some small measure, it will pay. But for his tender here, I make some stay. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid a love juice on some true love's sight. Of thy misprision must perforce ensue, some true love turn and our false turn true. Uh, then fate for rules, one man holding toast, confounding oath on oath. About the wood, go swifter than the wind, and Helen of Athens, look thou find. Of fancy sick, she is pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cause the flesh, 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 blood dear. By some illusion, bring her here, I'll charm his eyes against she do appear. Uh, look, I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than an arrow from the Tartars, though. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink an apple of his eye when his love he doth espy. Wake when she be by. Captain of our fairy bed. Helen has here at hand, in youth mistook in my knee, pleading for lovers' feet. Shall we find potency? Lord, what fools these mortals be? Stand aside, the noise they make will cause Demetrius to wait. Uh, then two at once, little one. Why should you think I will scorn? Scorn, Persian, never come in tears. Look, when I bow, I weep, and bow so born, and the nativity, O oh, truth, appears. Why should these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more. When truth kills truth, O oh, devilish holy freight, these vows are Hermias. Do you give her over? Wait, oath with oath, and you will nothing wait. Your vows to her and me, put into scales, will even wait, both as light as hairs. I had no judgment when I to her swore. Nor none in my mind. Now you give her over? Demetrius loves her and loves not you. Oh, Helen. Goddess. <laughs> Nymph. Perfect. <laughs> Divine. To what, my love, shall I compare that iron? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripe and show thy lips. Those kissing cherries tempt and grow. That pure congealed white high Taurus of snow, fanned with the eastern wind, turns to a crow when thou holds up thy hand. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white. The seal of bliss. Oh, spite! Oh, hell! I see you all at bent. Say that again to me for your merriment. If you were civil in your courtesy, you would not do me that much injury. Can you not hate me, as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too? If you are men, as men you are in show, you would not use gentle ladies so. To bow and swear and super praise my parts, when I'm sure you hate me with your hearts. He you both are rivals and love Hermia, and I both rivals to mock Helena? A trim exploit, a manly enterprise. You launch your tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. <coughs> Not of noble sort, but so offend a virgin, and so our poor soul's patience all to make you sport. You are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so, for you love Hermia. This you know I know. And now, with all good will, with all my heart, and Hermia's love, I yield you on my part. And yours of Helena, to me bequeath, whom I do love, and will do to my death. Never did mockers waste my idle breath. Lysander, keep the Hermia. I will none. If I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to her but has guessed why I sojourned, and now to Helen is at home returned. There to remain. Helen, it is not so! Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, lest to thy peril thou shalt abide dear. Look, for thy love comes, yonder is thy dear to you. Dark night, that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes. Wherein it doth impair the same sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not by mine eye, Lysander found, mine ear, I think it, brought me to thy sound. But why kindly did thou leave me so? Why should he stay, whom love doth press to go? What love can oppress Lysander from my side? Lysander's love, that would not let him bide. For Helena, who more in guilt tonight than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seekest thou me? Could this not make thee know? The hate I bear thee made me leave thee so. You speak not as you think. It cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three, to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid. Have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bid me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we do have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours we have spent, when we have chid, chid the hasty footed time for parting us? All is all forgot? All school days, friendship, childhood, innocence? We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created one flower, both on one sampler, sing on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, our minds, our voices have been incorporate. So we grew together, like to a double cherry seeming parted, but yet in union, in partition. Two lovely berries molded on one stem, so with two seeming bodies, but one heart. Two of the first, like coats and heraldry, do but one, and crowns one crest. So will you run arrange it love asunder, to join if men in scorning your poor friend? It is not friendly, it is not maidenly. Our sex is I may try thee for it, but I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face? And made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot, to call me nymph, goddess, rare, divine, precious, celestial? Where doth he speak this hurry he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul, and tend to me forsooth affection, but by your sending on, by your consent? 
What though I be so not embraces you, so hung upon for love, so fortunate, but miserable most, to love on love. This you should pity, rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. Aye, to persevere, counterfeit sad looks, big mouths upon me when I turn my back, hold this to be just up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. And for you, well, it's partly my own fault, but she doth her absence soon shall remedy. Stay, gentle Helena, hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, for help. Oh, excellent, we do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. <laughs> Thou canst compel no more than she entreat. <laughs> Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helena, I love thee by my life I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee, to prove him false who says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come! Lysander, where two tens all Away, Ethiop! No, no, you'll seem to break loose. Take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man, go! Hang up! Thou cat, thou burr, vile thing, let loose! Or I'll shake thee from me like a sharp! Why hast thou grown so rude? What changes this sweet love? Thy love, out! Tony your daughter, out! Out, loathed medicine, hated potion, hence! Do you not jest? Yes, suit, and so do you. Demetrius, I'll keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll trust not your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What greater harm can you do me than hate? Hate me! Wherefore, O oh me, what news is this, my love? Am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? I must fare now as I was erewhile. By night you loved me, by night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, the gods forbid and earnest, shall I say? I, by my life, I never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain nothing to her. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, me, you juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, of faith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no such a bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you. Puppet? Why so? I that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures, and that she hath urged her height with her personage, she hath forsooth of him. And are you grown so high in his esteem, because I'm so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? How low am I? Am I not yet so low that my nails can reach you to thine eyes? I pray you, though you mock me. Gentlemen, let it not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think because she is something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower her again! Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I ever more did love you, Hermia. Ever kept your counsels, never wronged you. Save that, and love unto Demetrius. I told him of herself into this wood. He followed you, and for love, I followed him. But he hath chid me hence, and threatened me, to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. So now you let me quiet go. Back to Athens will I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go. You see how simple and fond I am? Why get you gone? What is it that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her place. When she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again, nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Get gone, you dwarf, you minimus, of hindering not grass maid, you feed, you acorn. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Take not her part, speak not of Helena. Let her alone. If thou dost intend so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide. Now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darest, to try whose right, of thine or mine, is most in Helena. Follow. Nay, I'll go with thee. Cheek by jaw. You, mistress, all this coil is long of you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you. I no longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands in my cook are quicker for a fray. My legs are long enough to run away. I'm made for not what you say. <sighs> this is thy negligence. Till thou mistake it, or else committest these knaveries willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did you not tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? In so far, Blamus proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes, and that you best please me. Thou seest these lovers, they seek a place to fight. Hide therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The sorry welkin cover thou anon, with drooping fog as black as Acheron, and leave ye testy rivals so astray that one come out with another's way. And back to the <coughs> Athens the lover shall wend. My king of shadows, this must be done with haste. And yonder shines Ve Venus, <laughs> and ghost approach wants to <laughs> wandering here and there, uh, church homes and blood, but we are spirits of another sort. 
I, with the morning's love, have off made sport. But haste, make no delay. We must affect this business yet ere dinner. Up and down, up and down. I will lead them up and down. I'm feared in the field and town. Go up and lead them up and down. Here comes one. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, draw up. Ready, where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow, follow me then to plainer ground. Lysander, speak again. Thou runaway, the coward, art thou fled? Speak, in some bush, where dost thou hide thy head? Coward, art thou bragging to the stars? Tell us the bush, lookest for wars. Wilt not come, come, Rika, come thou child, or with thee the rod he is defiled. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice, we try no manhood here. He goes before me and still dares me on. When I come where he calls, then he is gone. The villain is much lighter healed than I. I followed fast, but faster he did fly. Well, at fallen I am in a dark, uneven way, and he will rest me. Come, that gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy gray light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. <laughs> Coward, comest thou not? By me, thou darest. For while I walk, thou runs before me, shifting every place, but dare not stand, nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. Nay, then thou mocks me. I shalt buy this dear if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. Fate is constrained me to measure out my length on this cold bed. By day's approach, look to be visited. Oh, very night, nice. oh, long and tedious night. Abate thy hours, shun comforts from the east, so let me back to Athens by daylight. Oh, these are my poor company detest, and sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye. See me while for mine own company. Only but three, two of both kinds, kinds make up four. Here she comes, curt and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus make poor females mad. Never so weary, never so in woe. Dabbled by two and torn of briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My likes can keep no pace with my desires. Here will they rest me till the break of day. Heaven shield thy sander if they mean a fray. On the ground, sleep and sound, I apply to your eye, gentle lover remedy, when thou wakest, thou takest. <coughs> sleep, sleep on thy eyelid. The deaf shall have jilled, not chug it ill. The man shall have his merrigan, and all shall be well. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I the name of her cheeks do coy. And stick muscles in my sleek smooth head, and kiss thy large fair ears, my gentle joy. <sighs> Where's Peas Blossom? Ready. Good Master Peas Blossom, scratch my head. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Good Monsieur Cobweb, get your weapon in hand and kill me a red hipped humblebee on the top of a thistle. Then, good Monsieur, fetch me the honey bag. But do not loathe yourself, uh, do not fret yourself too much in this action, for I would be loath to have you overflown with a honey bag, good monsieur. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready. Monsieur Mustard Seed, give me your neat, I pray you, leave your courtesy. What's your will? Nothing, good monsieur, but to help Calvary uh, Cobweb scratch. For methinks I must to the barbers, I am such a marvelously hairy about the face, and I am such a tender ass. When my hair do tickle me, I must scratch. What wilt thou hear some music nice me of? Mm, I have a reasonably good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. Or say, sweet love, what wilt thou desire us to eat? Truly a peck of provender. I could munch on your good dry oats. For me thinks I desire a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, hath no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek these schools hoard and fetch the new nets. I had rather had a handful or two of dried peas, but I pray you, let your people not stir me, for I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will win thee in my arms. Fairies be gone, and be always away. So doth the one bind the sweet honeysuckle, gently and twist the female ivory so, and rings the barkly fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. Welcome, gentle puck. Seest thou the sweet sight? Her daughters know I do begin to pity. For meeting her of late behind the woods, seeking sweet favors for these hateful fool. 
I did upbraid her and fall out with her. For I, out of my, for I had at my pleasure taunted her, and I did then did ask of her her changing child, the straight she gave me, and her fairy sent him to my bell in fairyland. And gentle puck, take this head off of the Athenian swain. First, I shall release my fairy queen. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love's sake. Love and languish for his sake. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. Oh, my Oberon, what the visions have I seen? Ye thought I was enamored of an ass. Where lies your love? Oh, how come these things to pass? Oh, how my eyes do loathe his vision now. Sound music, come, my queen. And did the fuck? Now, when thine own fool's eyes peep. Music, oh, music, such as charm as sleep. Sound music, come, my queen, take hands with me and rock the ground where all these sleepers be. Now, you and I, a new amity, will dance in de Duke and teach Jesus' house triumphantly. And these faithful pairs wedded be all in jollity. Oh, fairy king attended, Mark. I do hear the morning lark. Then, my queen, in silence sad, trip, trip we after night's shade. The glow we can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night. That I, sleeping here, was bound with these mortals on the ground. <laughs> One of you, find out the forester, for now observation is performed. And since we have the vows of the day, my love shall hear the music of my hounds. A couple in the western valley, let them go. Dispatch, I say, find out the forester. We will, fair queen, on the mountain's top, and mark the music with the confusion of pounds and echo in conjunction. I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bade the baritons of Sparta. Never did I hear such gallant fighting, for beside the groves, the skies, and the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. Never did I hear so musical discord, such sweet thunder. My hounds are brought out the Spartan hide, so fluid, so sandy, with heads hung low and ears that sweep away the morning dew, crooked kneed and dew like Thessalian bulls, slow in pursuit, but matched them out like bells. A final tune never was hollowed in Crete, nor in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear, but soft, when it's these. My noble lord, is my daughter here to sleep? And this Lysander is? This Demetrius is, this Helena, old Neater's Helena, I wonder if they're being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the ride of May, and the hearing of our encamp came here in grace of our solemnity. But speak of Jesus, is this not the day that Hermia must give her answer of choice? It is, my lord. Go, bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns. Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine's past. Begin these woodbirds, but the couple now? Pardon, my lord? I pray you all, stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle conquered in the world? The hatred is so far, so far from jealousy. To sleep by hatred of fear, no empathy. My lord, I shall reply amazedly. Half sleep, half wake. But as yet, I swear, I cannot truly say how I came here. But as I think, for truly I would speak, and now do bethink me. So it is, I came with Hermia hither, and our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might, without the peril of the Athenian law. Enough! Enough, my lord. It is enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away, they would. Demetrius, thereby to have defeated you and me, you of your wife, and me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. My lord, fair Helen told me of herself, of this uh, purpose hers his would. And I, in fury, had followed them, fair Helen, in fancy, following me. But my lord, I walk not by what power, but by some power it is. My love for Hermia, melted as the snow, seems to me now is the remembrance of an idle god, which I did dote upon in my childhood. And now, the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of my eye, is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed, ere I saw Hermia. But like in sickness did I learn this food, but as in health did it come to my natural taste. And now, I do love it, long for it, wish for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse, we will hear more anon. Aegeus, I will overpay your will. Friend the temple, by and by, this couple shall be eternally made. And since the morning is now something worn, our purpose hunting shall be set aside. Away with us, Athens. Three and three. We'll hold the feast in great solemnity. Come, Apollo. These things seem small and indistinguishable. 
like far off mountains turn to clouds. Methinks I see things with parted eye when everything seems double. So methinks, and I found Demetrius like a jewel, my own and not my own. Are you sure we're awake? It seems that yet we sleep, we dream. There's not the duke here. Did he not bid us follow him? Yea, and my father, and Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow the temple. Why, then we are awake. Let us go, and by the way, recount our dreams. When my cue comes, call me. My next is most fair pyramid. Hi, ho. Peter Quince, flute the bellows mender, snout the tinker, starveling. Oh, God's my life, hence and left me asleep. I've had a most rare vision. I've had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go out to expound this dream. Oh. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand not able to taste, his tongue nor to conceive, his heart to report what my dream was. I shall get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream, and that ballad shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom, and I shall sing it at the latter end of the play before the Duke and the Duchess, and I shall sing it most graciously at her death. Have you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt he is transported. If he come not, then the play is not marred. It goes not forward. Doth it? It is not possible. You have not men in all Athens able to portray Pyramus, but he. No, he has simply the best wits of any handicraftsman in Athens. Aye, and the best person too. He was very paramour for a sweet voice. You must say paragon. A paramour says, God bless us, a thing of naught. Masters, the duke is coming from the temple, and there is two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we'd all been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom, thus hath he lost sixpence a day during his life. He could not escape sixpence a day. And had the duke not given him sixpence a day for playing Pyramus, I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Sixpence a day for Pyramus or nothing. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Oh, bottom, you're not a donkey anymore. Ah. <laughs> uh. Masters, I am to discourse wonders, but ask me not what for. For if I tell you, I am no true Athenian. I will tell you all as it fell out. What is here, sweet bottom? Not a word of me. But all that I will tell you is, the duke hath dined. Grab your apparel, good strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. For every man should look over his part. For the short and the long is, our play is preferred. Everyone, um... And no one shall have onions or garlic, for we are to utter sweet breath. And I do not doubt that they will not call this a sweet comedy. Now away. Go away. Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers of madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, to apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehend. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet, of imagination all can pass. One sees more devils than thyself can hold. That is, the madman and the lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in the brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, and the fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth, the forms of things are known. The poet's pen turns it into shapes, and gives the airy nothing, a local habitation and a name. Such tricks have strong imagination, that if it apprehends in joy, it comprehends and bring of uh, that joy. Or in the night, imagining some feel, how easy is the most supposed to bear. But all the stories of the night told over, and all our minds transfigured so together, or witnesseth in fancy's images, and grows with something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy, and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Come now. What mass? What dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after supper and bedtime? Where's the usual manager of mirth? 
Is, are there no rebels in hand? Is there no plague easing English of a torturing hour? Call Philistrate! He may be Theus. Say, what a birds may have for this evening? How should we get out of the lazy town if not with some delight? There was a brief how many squads are right. Make choice of what your highness will see first. <clears throat> the battle with the centaurs be sang by Athenian eunuch to the heart. We'll have none of that. Have I told my love and glory my kinsman Hercules? The right of the tipsy Bacchanals, tearing the Thracian senior in their rage. That's an old device. It was played when Athens peace can last to conquer. The thrice three muses, mourning the death, the death of learning, late to see some beggary. That is some satire. Keen and critical, not so sorting with an upsoul ceremony. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical. Tedious and brief. That is hot ice and wonder, strange snow. How shall we find the conquered of this discord? A play of the res, my lord, some ten words long, which says we have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, is too long, which makes it tedious for an all to play. But tragical, my noble lord, it is, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which, when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water, but more merry tears, the passion of loud laughter never shed. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which have never labored in their minds till now, and have toiled with their unbreath memories with the same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world. Unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretch and calm, with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear it, for never anything can be amiss, when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, ladies. I love not to see what you have the car, and do you why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. The kind of weed to get the things for nothing? Our or shall we take with a mistake? Where I have come from, great clerks have purpose frequent premeditated welcomes. Where I have seen them shiver and look pale, make period in their sentences, throttle their kind of taxes, in conclusion, young they broke off, not paying me welcome. Trust me, sweet. Out of this silence, yeah, I think they welcome. And in the fearful duty of saucing my patient eloquence, love, therefore, tongue tied simplicity. At least just be close to my captain. So please, Your Grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach. <clears throat> if we offend, we come but in goodwill. That you should think we come not in offend, but with goodwill to show our simple skill. That is the true beginning of our end. Consider it then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to content you. Our true intent is all for your delights. We are not here as you are not here should offend you. The actors are at hand and by their show. You will know all and are like to know. This fellow doth not stand upon the wings. The end of it is both like a rough cult. He knows not the stop. Of good moral, my lord, it is not enough to speak, but to speak the truth. Indeed, he hath played his prologue like a child on a recorder, a sound on our government. His speech is like a tangled chain. Nothing of it, but all this order. Who is next? Gentles, perchance you wonder at the show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lazy Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which these lovers did sunder. And through walls chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper, at the which let no man wonder. This man with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn doth present moonshine, for if you would know. By moonshine did these lovers think no scorn, to meet at Nynas' tomb, there, there to woo. This grisly beast which lie in height by name, the trusty Thisbe coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright, and as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds this trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, whereat, with blade, with bloody, blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling, bloody breast, and Thisbe, tearing in the mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moon, wall, and lovers twain at large discourse while here they do remain. Oh, what if the lion be? No wonder, my lord. What lion may be In this same interlude, it doth befall that I, once snout by name, present a wall, and such a wall as I would have you think that had in it a crannied hole or chink, through which the peerful lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did whisper often, very secretly, this loam, this rough cast, and this stone, doth show that I am the same wall, the truth is so, and this the cranny is, right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are to whisper. What is thy line of heresy better? It is the wittiest partition, my lord, that ever I heard discourse. <laughs> Give it to the wall, silence.
O grim-look night, O night with hue so black, O night, whichever art when day is not, O night, O night, alack, alack, alack. <laughs> o wall, O sweet, O lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine, O wall, O oh, sweet, O oh, lovely wall, <laughs> show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. <laughs> Thanks, courteous wall. You're welcome. Jove shield thee well for this. But what see I? No thisbe do I see, O oh, wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss. Cursed be thy sons for thus deceiving me. The wall may make sense. So curse again. No, in truth, sir, he should not. <laughs> For Thisbe is to come out, deceiving me is her cue, and I am to spy on her through the wall. Yonder, she comes. <laughs> oh, wall, the last hast thou heard my moans, from parting my fair fearless and me. My cherry lips have up to kiss thy stones, thy stones, with lime and hair knit up in thee. I see a voice. Show me thy chink. <laughs> Thisbe! My love, thou art my love, I think. Think what thou wilt, but I am thy lover's grace. Oh, like Lymander, I am trusty still. And I, like Helen, till the fates me kill. Not shaftless to Procris was so true. As chapel is to procreate, I to you. Oh, kiss me through this hole of this vile wall. <laughs> I kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. Oh, wilt thou at Ninny's tomb meet me straightway? Tight life, tight death, I come without delay. Thus have I, wall, <laughs> my part discharged so, and being done, the swallow I death go! This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. The best in the town of the shadows, and the worst in the worst of imagination of men then. Must be your imagination then, not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them, that they themselves, they, they may pass the excellent men. And here come the two noble beasts, a man and a lion. You, ladies, you, whose gentle hearts do fear, the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor, may now both quake and tremble here, when lion rough in wildest rage doth roar, and know that I, one, snug the joiner, am a lion fell, nor else no lion's dam. For if I should as lion come and strife into this place, twere pity on my life. A very gentle beast, and of good conscience. The very best of beasts that ever I saw. This lion is very fox for his valor. True, and a goose for his discretion. Not so, for his valor cannot carry his discretion. A fox carries a goose. His discretion, I am sure, cannot carry his valor. The goose carries not the fox. It is well. Leave it be, and we shall listen to the moon. This lanthorn doth the horn moon present. He should have worn the horns on his head. He is no present, and his horns are visible within the circumference. This lanthorn doth the horn moon present. Myself the man in the moon I do seem to be. This is the greatest air of all the rest. The man should be put into the lantern. How else is he the man in the moon? He chance not come up for the candle, for you see, it's already snuffed. I have a weary of this moon, would you would change? It appears, by his light of discretion, that he's in the way. But yet, in courtesy, we must save the time. Proceed, moon. All I have to say is to tell you that this lanthorn is the moon, and myself the man in the moon. And this thorn bush, my thorn bush. And this dog, my dog. Why, all these should be in the lantern, for all these are in the moon. But silence, here comes Tisby. This is old Nini's tomb. Where is my love? Roar! Oh, sweet moon, thank you for shining now so bright, for by thy gracious golden glittering gleams I trust to take 
of truest Fisbee sight. But stay, O spite, but mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here? Eyes, do you see? How can it be? O oh, dainty duck, O oh, dear! Oh. <laughs> Thy mantle good, what stained with blood, approach ye furies fell. Oh. Out ye sword, to thy pap eye, that left pap, where heart doth hop. Oh. Oh. Now my soul is in the sky. Tongue, lose thy light. <laughs> Moon, take thy flight. <laughs> now die! 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 You don't die in one case for him, for he is but one. Less than an ace, man, for he is dead. He's nothing. With the help of the surgeon, he might er yet recover and prove an ass. How chance Moonshine is gone before Disney comes back to find her lover? She will find him by starlight, and here she comes, and her passion has to play. We see that she not need a long one for such a pyramid. I hope she'll be brief. A most will turn the balance of the pyramids which Disney are the He for a man God born, <laughs> and she for a man God bless us. She hath already spied him with those sweet eyes, and thus she means he does it. Asleep, my love? <laughs> what? Dead, my dove? Oh, Pyramus, arise! Speak, speak! Quite dove, dead, dead! A tooth must cover thy sweet eyes. These lily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow cast of cheeks are gone. Please you to see the epilogue, or to hear the Burgo mass dance between the two of our company? No epilogue, I pray you. For your play needs no excuse. If the had who had written it, had played Pyramus and hung himself with this disorder, it would have been a fine tragedy, so it's very noble, and so it's just charge. But come, your Burgo mass, let your epilogue alone. The iron tongue until twelve, lovers to bed. I fear we shall sleep to come morn. It is very time. Away with us. Mouse shall disturb this hollowed house. I'm set with a broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. <laughs> Through the house gave glimmering night by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite, hop as light as bird from briar, and as ditty after me, sing and dance it trippingly. First rehearse your song by row, to each word a rambling note, hand in hand with fairy grace, we will sing and bless this place. If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. Now this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. Gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest punk, if we have unearned luck now to scrape the serpent's tongue, to make amends ere long. Elsa Puck, a liar call, so good night unto you all. Give me your hand if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. <laughs>